Hello and welcome. <laughs> Sorry, that's pretty that's pretty loud. That was a great a great opening. Uh thanks wife. Okay, let me change my audio just a little bit. <laughs> and I had it up uh a little bit too loud too. So extra extra good. Um <laughs> uh, anyway, hello. So I'm starting a little bit different today. I'm just doing the opening with uh, my my face and then a picture from the park. So trying something out a little bit new. And while everyone gets settled, I'll give a little bit of background on the park or on the uh, the live stream. So for anyone new to the stream, each week we pick a new national park to explore together. And this week we're exploring New River Gorge National Park in beautiful West Virginia, uh, as you can see from uh, folks singing in the chat a little bit. Thank you for that, Fractals and uh, and Flying Singer. Uh, and Flying Singer, I'll take a, a left to course. To answer your question. Um, other thing to know, we'll vote near the end on the next national park we'd like to explore together. So keep an eye out for that and other polls and questions in the chat. And if you have thoughts or ideas as we're flying around, uh, feel free to post them up. I love chatting with all of you. Little disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator today. So please don't try this in real life. I've also researched the park and a couple of related topics in preparation and helped improve their Wikipedia pages. Using Wikipedia makes it sure, makes sure that the facts here are cited and checked by others and gives back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour together. To that end, if you notice anything that could be better clarified or is missing, please help improve the Wikipedia pages. As the wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. Without further ado, I'm Jules Altus, and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore New River Gorge National Park. Look at that transition. I know some streamers have a little tablet they'll use to to do their their scene transitions. I have an old uh, tablet lying around actually. Maybe I'll, I'll do that. All right. So today I'm in an Icon A5. It's a nice little amphibious plane. It's kind of like that. It also seems to be a little windy, so I just have clear weather. It's about 8.30 uh, liftoff time here for anyone who's flying along. And I'm flying Stringer, so I'll take a left out of the airport and then continue on course. I'll also go uh, relatively slow uh, through the through the park. It takes about an hour to do through, through to the end, um, uh, depending on how fast you fly it. Um, but that's, uh, that's what I'm aiming for. All right, let me get myself set up here. Thank you very much, Fractals. So Fractals just posted a chat up, or a poll, excuse me. So the question is, uh, have you been, oops, I'm trying to enable my water rudder, excuse me, disable my water rudder. Come on, there we go, okay, great. Um, so the question is, have you been to New River Gorge National Park? This is the newest national park, so you may have been there when it was uh, not yet a national park. So this was declared a national park uh, at the very end of 2020. So yes in the last 10 years, yes once upon a time, or not yet. Give folks a second to vote on that. Uh, Fractals, if you could, oh, you already posted, uh, excellent. Look at Fractals, is so on it. So Fractals posted the flight plan as well as a way to follow along online. If you don't have Microsoft Flight Simulator, you wanna see where we're flying. Uh, as well as I mentioned Icon A5, it's a clear sky day for me, and I took off about one hour after sunrise. That seems to be when I get the best shadows on the on the mountains, but you can play with the weather as much as you want. It's very pretty to do with snow, actually. No administrative updates today, so we'll launch right into the park. I see that we have five votes for not yet, uh, which I hope by the end of this stream you'll you'll be excited to go and visit. I definitely am. It's also a, a, a really, so one of the major highways through West Virginia crosses through the park. And so a lot of folks who have driven through there have crossed it without realizing that it's it's a, a full park that they can go and, and explore a little bit more. So it's possible that you've, you've crossed it without knowing before. Maybe you'll recognize the bridge. It's the same one at the opening. So New River Gorge National Park and Preserve is designated to protect and maintain the New River Gorge, uh, oops, seeing a bunch of dropped frames. Okay, we'll see if that comes back through. Let me know if it's uh, 
if it's dropping too much, I'll look for. It's gonna be, yeah. Once upon a time, yeah. Um, sorry, totally lost my train of thought, but I, I uh, heading back on course towards Hinton, so we should be good. So the New River Gorge National Park is meant to protect the New River Gorge in southern West Virginia in the Appalachian Mountains. It was established in 1978 as a national river, and the uh, National Park Service protected area stretches for 53 miles just downstream of Hinton, which is that first waypoint that you can see just ahead of us, and then it flows northward to Hawks Nest State Park. Uh, the park was officially named America's 63rd National Park on December 2020, so just a couple months ago. Uh, so I'm I'm actually really excited to be to be flying around it. It's it's cool to see these sorts of places get get that extra level of recognition. It's pretty fun. It's also featured on West Virginia's quarter. So let me flip over here real quick. So you may have one of these uh, lying in your pocket or on a table somewhere. If you keep an eye out, you'll come across it. It's a New River Gorge, West Virginia. The park is rich in cultural and historical uh, and natural history and offers an abundance of scenic and recreational opportunities. New River Gorge is home to some of the country's best whitewater rafting, mainly uh, from the uh, Cunard Put-In and the Fayette Station Takeout, so we'll fly actually past both of those two areas. We'll talk more about whitewater rafting in a little bit. That's a small spoiler. New River Gorge is also one of the most popular climbing areas in the East Coast, with over 1,400 established rock climbs. There's a video of the park that I'll play after our first topic, and I want to save it till after the first topic because you'll notice more things in, in some of the pictures. But the there's also shots they have of the rock walls that are worth checking out. The new or the river itself, New River it's called, is considered by some geologists to be one of the oldest rivers in the world. Uh, the Wikipedia article about oldest rivers in the world has it as third oldest, so at least that's the best that the, the Wikipedia community could, could land on. Uh, but you'll see mostly when they talk about it, they cite it as definitely the oldest in North America, or sorry, in the United States, and probably one of the oldest in the world. The New River flows generally south to north, as I mentioned, and it flows directly through the Appalachian Plateau. And that's pretty unusual for the other rivers on the Appalachian Mountains, which would flow more west to east, uh, when they're on the east side, and then from west, east to west when they're on the west side. So they typically flow away from the mountains. Uh, this one flows north to west right along the plateau. And I mentioned that we have that, that kind of park intro video. That's kind of fun. I will play a little bit more of that later on. Uh, but for now, let's dive into our first topic. You see the X uh, Flying Singer, I can't see you quite as well off in the distance, but I will let you know if I if I can make out the floats. If you wanted to, and you were feeling adventurous, the landing just after Hinton, there's a pretty good stretch of water that you could attempt a water landing, uh, and I'll, I'll come land next to you. We can see if I can see your floats or not. Otherwise, I'll, I'll plan to do a water landing right before the New River Gorge Bridge as well. So we'll meet up at some point. All right, thank you, Fractal. So why is whitewater? So our first topic is whitewater and whitewater rafting, kayaking, and canoeing. Kind of the sports and the activities around there. Why is whitewater, whitewater, like actual whitewater, less buoyant than normal water? It's just a lifestyle choice, dude. Or <laughs> to be more appealing to play boaters and squirt boaters. Those are both things we'll talk about in a minute. Or is it air is trapped within the water, making it frothy and less buoyant? a second to vote on that one. See a couple coming in for C there. So while people are voting, a little bit about the connection to the park. So I mentioned in the intro that uh, New River Gorge National Park includes the 53 miles of free-flowing New River, and it's one of the best whitewater uh, areas, especially if you want to see that big West Virginia whitewater style, style of whitewater uh, activity. Within the park, there's two very different characteristics that you can go and find. In the upper, the southern part of the river, remember because it flows sort of north, south to north, it'll consist primarily of long pools and essentially and relatively easy rapids. So kind of class three rapids. Uh, rapids go from class one to class six, with class three being, I wouldn't say easy, but they're relatively easy. Uh, class six would be you cannot attempt them, just for reference. So five would be about as hard as it gets. 
realistically. The lower, the northern section of the river is often referred to as the lower gorge. Uh, in a state justifiably renowned for its colossal rapids, the lower gorge has some of the biggest is some of the biggest of the big with rapids ranging from uh, class three to class five difficulty. The rapids are imposing and forceful, many of them obstructed by large boulders, which necessitate maneuvering in very powerful currents, cross currents, and hydraulics. All right, so what is, oops, I should actually look at that poll real quick. Thank you very much. So the top choice on that one was uh, that the correct answer. So air is trapped within the water, making it frothy and less buoyant. And you'll see that when we watch a little, I have a couple pictures and videos of white water. Look for the, the kind of turbulence that creates that color and you'll start to see it in, in all of these different places. So what is white water? Like I was talking about, it, it's when a river generates so much turbulence that air is trapped within the water. This forms an unstable current that froths, making the water appear opaque and white. You've probably all seen white water before, but just a reminder, this is sort of the, the in real life version of that. The term white water also has a broader meaning, applying to any river or creek that has a significant number of rapids. So if you hear when people refer to just white water in general, that can, it can mean a little bit broader. To create white water, there's sort of four factors that, that come into play. There's gradient, constriction, obstruction, and flow rate. Gradient constriction and obstruction are uh, stream bed topography features, and they're relatively constant. So these are things that are just the nature of the stream itself, and so that's what you end up finding. Flow rate is dependent upon both seasonal variation in precipitation and snowmelt, as well as the uh, release of upstream dams. So if the river's dam for some reason, that will give you a different sort of flow rate as well. To dive a little bit more into each of those, so the first one I mentioned was gradient. So that's the rate at which the river changes elevation along its course. That basically determines the river's slope and alert, to a large extent determines the rate of flow of the water. So shallow gradients produce shallow, uh, slow flowing rivers and steep gradients produce fast flowing rivers. An obstruction then would be a boulder or a ledge in the middle of the river or near the side that can obstruct the flow of the river. Um, Oh, let me quick cover constriction because obstruction we have a couple of fun photos I'll pull up. So constriction is when the river's flow is forced into a narrower channel. So as the channel narrows of the river, that causes the water to move more rapidly through. And so that exacerbates anything that you see with uh, obstructions or any other kind of factors in the, in the flow. Then jumping to obstruction. So this would be like a boulder or a ledge. There's a couple of different things that, that can occur with these. So one of them is a, uh, I'll name three and then I'll show a video that has all three of them in it. So the first one is a pillow, and a pillow, or pillow, oh, I'm going to get some, yeah, anyway, someone can make fun of me for my accent, I'm sure. Um, anyway, it's, it's when water flows backwards upstream of the obstruction. So a uh, pillow would be if, you're, if the water's hitting a boulder and then it kind of um, halts right in front of the boulder, sort of, sort of sits there, pillows off of it. Pour over would be when it passes over the top of a boulder. And then an eddy would, may form behind an obstruction as the flow uh, passes. So you've probably seen an eddy in real life, but this is the kind of physics of it. So you have some obstruction that creates these sort of eddies behind. You can also get eddies in the atmosphere. So this is this something interesting, and, and Flying Singer is, is another pilot. You'll probably uh, recognize this as well, is a lot of the phenomena that you run into with whitewater rafting are phenomena that you run into with mountain flying. And the reason for that is the air in the atmosphere behaves very similarly to that. So for instance, this is... Uh, currents of air that are flowing over islands and those create eddies just like you see in the water so you can see those just coming off of the islands off here so i mentioned i have a video that has all three of those to so look for pillows pour overs and eddies in this one i'll pull this up i might be able to play it right from here let me turn down the volume though because it's Playback is a little bit jumpy, I'm not sure why, but you'll see, there you go, so there's a pillow right there, there's a bunch of pour-overs going on, and if you look downstream, yeah, it has a little bit of that, yeah, it is. so quick, quick sampler of uh, different types of those. The other thing you may come across is hydraulics, or holes, and that's where the river flows back onto itself. They're called this because the foamy aerated water provides, it's called a hole, because the foamy aerated water provides less buoyancy, and so it can actually feel like a hole in the river surface. So I mentioned that it, it 
looks it looks white the water looks like uh, is, is white water because it has air in it and when you have that sort of hole or hydraulic it's so much so that it can actually feel like a hole you can think of a hydraulic as that same thing as an eddy but turned on its side so um, I'm, I'm about to pull up another picture so i won't clear this one yet but uh, so, so if you think of an eddy as is sort of in the the uh, horizontal plane then a hydraulic is the same thing as an eddy but in the vertical plane and that can cause water to, to double back on itself a hydraulic jump then forms when high velocity flow discharges into a zone of lower velocity flow this causes an abrupt rise in the liquid surface so you'll see these around dams a lot it's like this is a picture of a dam where it has a, a very pronounced hydraulic jump you also see them in your sink from time to time so next time you're washing your hands take a look and you'll see this sort of ring pattern the edge of that ring is the hydraulic jump it's where the high velocity water gets a zone of lower velocity and same sort of phenomena as you get in the dam and then of course it happens naturally in rivers so this is a, a group of rafters going over and hitting a hydraulic jump those holes or hydraulics that i mentioned they're also called play spots from time to time and so i mentioned in the poll you saw the term play spotter or uh play boater excuse me and so that's uh, someone who goes in and will take like a kayak into these little holes, these hydraulics, because they're stationary. Uh, basically, the water is is doubling back on itself, and so it stays in place. And so you can go and do tricks or just, you know, play around, right? That's why it's called a play spot. <laughs> Pickle. Funny. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it in there later. I'll try and remember to do that. Okay, so that's the... Uh, that's the first three. And then the stream flow rate is just an increase or decrease in flow that can create a uh, washout of a rapid. So if it was, if there's such a heavy water flow that it covers over a boulder, then it would wash out the rapid. Uh, you can get the opposite though. If the water drops lower than before, that would expose hazards that you may not have seen otherwise, uh, or it may just change the characteristics of the river. I'm going to pop out real quick and, and show some of the scenery here. So this is the Bluestone National Scenic River very pretty little area to go uh, canoeing kayaking speaking of i don't know I, I didn't get the impression this was a whitewater area but um but it's still a very pretty place to go Let's see i'll probably stay out like this for the next bit here because it's, it's kind of a fun park to see from the sky so i mentioned with whitewater that you measure the grade off on a, on a scale of one to six so one is the easiest and safest and then a six would be the most difficult and most dangerous if you do want to go whitewater rafting, which I would recommend if you haven't, um, make sure to check what kind of what kind of class of, of rapids you're dealing with. Actually, question for the chat, I suppose: uh, Who has been whitewater rafting? And anyone have any any fun stories? Uh, I went. I don't know how many years ago, but a long time ago, I went, and I remember it being a very fun time. But I mostly remember that same sort of hydraulic jump. I remember hitting the bottom of something and just having water pour over the boat, which is a pretty, a pretty cool experience, all told. Right, let's get a little bit lower here. So as far as boats go, you can take a number of different kinds for whitewater activities. So the story I just told was in a rafting, a raft, just a, a rafting boat, kind of an inflatable big one. Uh, but there's a lot of other options. So one that you may encounter is this whitewater kayak, which looks like this. And they're often shorter and more maneuverable than sea kayaks and are specially designed to deal with water flowing up onto their decks. Water kayaks are, whitewater kayaks are fairly stable in turbulent water once the paddler is skilled in them. If you flip your whitewater kayak upside down, you can do a trick called the, not really a trick, it's kind of standard, standard operating procedure called the Eskimo roll, or just simply a roll. So I've never seen an Eskimo roll. This is a pretty grainy gif, but it's the best one I could find uh, that was Creative Commons. And so you'll notice that he takes his paddle, he lays it along his side, he rolls, and then he uses the paddle. He doesn't push off the ground, he just uses the paddle itself to kind of roll himself back upright. And so if you hit a rapid wrong and you need to, to quickly right yourself, you can do that sort of Eskimo roll to recover. Apparently it was a technique just a side side back apparently it was a technique developed for narw narwhal hunting well, that's a fun fact for your next uh fun fact gathering i mentioned rafts so they're more stable than kayaks this is the kind of one that i took out less maneuverable but they can carry a large load so they'll be used for expeditions 
catching up on the chat here. Fine. Been a few times for Actos, Crazy Tycho, awesome. Flying Stinger, that sounds fun. Western Massachusetts, yep. Uh, New Blood Dose Trace, you gotta go. It's pretty fun. <laughs> uh, fractals, that's pretty funny. That's good. That's good friends, I suppose. I, my favorite is the... I guess it doesn't apply as much with waterproof phones, but um, whenever someone asked if they could see your phone real quick next to a pool, you knew it was going to happen. All right, the other ones, a couple of quick ones. So there's uh, a whitewater canoe, slightly different design, use a canoe paddle. There's also something called a river bug, which is a small, single-person inflatable craft where a person's feet stick out one end. River bugging is done feet first with no paddle. You see he's got his little feet sticking out there. Also, doesn't he look like he's having fun? Look at that face. Poor guy. Anyway, there's a picture before this one in the, in the thing that uh, is a little bit more, a little bit more excited. The other one that you can see is a squirt boat. So I mentioned uh, squirt boaters. So a squirt boat is where the boat is designed to be as low in volume as possible while still floating. Are still allowing the paddler to float, excuse me. So it's actually built for your body mass so that it barely floats when you are using it. Uh, squirt boats are designed to use both surface and underwater currents to maneuver within the water. It's another dimension to work with. Now we're coming into the park here, so let me flip back out just so you can see kind of the entry point. And then I'll finish up, uh, talk a little bit about the sport version of whitewater kayaking. So just off to our right is Hinton. This is the town at the end of the park. I believe that that is the train track right there. You can kind of see it along the along the coast. So the CNO railroad runs along this entire thing, which is super relevant to our our second topic we'll talk about. It's a beautiful little area, and you'll notice the kind of a little bit more shallow gorge in this section. When we get a little further downstream, a little further north, you'll see that that kind of New River Gorge, the sort of picture from the beginning. All right. Let's continue our adventure, huh? So what does the sport version look like of whitewater rafting? Canoeing has been featured as competition sports in the Summer Olympic Games since the 1936 Games in Brazil, although they were, they were a demonstration sport in the 1928 Games in Paris. Sorry, 1924 Games in Paris. There's two disciplines of canoeing that you see in an Olympic competition. So this is the Summer Olympics. There's a sprint, where athletes just race in a canoe, so that looks sort of like this. There are a couple of variations on, on sprint. Can use your kayaks and it's across calm water. The other version is called slalom, which I actually had never heard of before seeing this. And so slalom, the aim is to navigate a decked canoe or kayak through a course of hanging downstream or upstream gates on a river rapids in the fastest time possible. So you're making your way down these rapids and you have to hit all these gates as you go. Now a cool idea for a sport, if you ask me. And I'd never seen one of the courses, but this is a course from the Brazil Games. So this is where they competed, and you can see the gates kind of set up on the left side here. The version in Los Angeles for the 2028 Games, uh, which will be held in Los Angeles, not in Mammoth Cave or in the Karst Caves, uh, despite my best efforts. Uh, the version there will be held near a empty dam, actually. So it's kind of a cool venue for, for Los, uh, Los Angeles. I don't know if I said Vegas before I met Los Angeles. For those of you who are interested in going to the 2028 Summer Olympics. There are many other variations of the sport though, so there's just wild water kayaking, which is where you race a stretch of open river as fast as possible. There's also freestyle kayaking, where you perform various technical moves in one place. So this is that play spot that we talked about before. So in this case he's doing an aerial loop. Uh, there's tons and tons of, of tricks you can do when you're just sort of, sort of riding a standing wave, basically. I'll catch up on the chat real quick. Oh, Fractal's lost a few good phones. Yeah, the river bug photo is is one of my favorites. It's like, it seems like such a cool, weird mix of, of, approaches, but also seems like a blast. And yet this guy looks just just terrified. So, I, it's my kind of sport to be honest. That's the kind of thing that I would like to do. All right, so in summary, whitewater forms when a river generates so much turbulence that the air trapped uh, that air is trapped within the water. This forms an unstable current that froths and makes uh, making the water appear opaque and white. Rotate around here, you can see around the river bend. 
There are a number of artifacts around Whitewater that you'll see in a river. Particularly interesting, uh, a particularly interesting one that you may not have known about is a play spot. Those hydraulic uh, hydraulics or holes. The difficulty of Whitewater rafting goes from one to six, and there are many many sports based around the Whitewater activities. Of course, it's a shame that there's not more Whitewater Olympic sports, right? Because there's only the slalom, and there's only there's only the slalom and the sprint, and there's so many other versions of it that are pretty cool, like freestyle kayaking, right? Or it's squirt boating would be a blast to watch. Uh, that's the one where you're like riding super low in the water. And so I was talking with my wife about this, and she mentioned that the real trick to get it into the Olympics would be to try and blend some sports. So picture this: competitors are all lined up, and they're at the start of the New River Gorge. They've got their rafting team got their life jackets, they've got their knitting needles, and the winner needs the fastest time down the course and with the best knit mittens. Who will be this year's Olympic gold medal whitewater crafter? Huh? It's pretty good. <laughs> the courtesy of, of my wife, thank you for the, for the wordplay. Anyway, we've been giggling about whitewater crafting for, for a little while now, so I hope that uh, I hope that makes your day a little bit too. All right, real quick off to our right, this is a Sandstone Visitor Center that we're passing. This is uh, one place that you can go and, and get an overview of the park and learn a little bit more. It's e easily accessible by the uh, highway, which is nice. Pretty little area as well. Our next place that we're going to see is called the Grand View Overlook. I'll pull that up actually. Let me, oh, that's my first picture, so I'll show you then. <laughs> uh, fractals in Nevada's face. Yep. You are welcome. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned that there's that park video that has kind of an overview of the park. Uh, let me pull that up real quick because now that we've talked a little bit about whitewater raft, uh, whitewater, excuse me, activities, you will recognize a couple more things. So look for those uh, play spots, look for the eddies, look for all that kind of stuff in this video. It also touches on a bunch of other stuff. It's not as much about the history, it's more about the activities to do in the park, but it's got a lot of good images. Um, I won't pull up as many photos today because this video covers it really, really well. Um, so yeah, enjoy. So I, I do apologize for the music. It's a little bit much, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll make it work. National River, where we have over 100 miles of hiking. So is that just mirrors? Their voices are really quiet. Biking trails, 55 miles. Mm. Welcome to New River Gorge National River, where we have over 100 miles of hiking. Biking trails, 55 miles of river, and world-class rock climbing. Got a few minutes? We'll show you what we're talking about. On the upper and middle gorge, 
There's class two and three rapids with quieter water for fishing and swimming. On the lower end, there's class four and five rapids to challenge the expert and advance. Wherever you are, remember, New River is fast and high volume. It has sudden drop-offs, strong currents, and a rocky, uneven bottom. Got one of these? Wear it and wear it right. It is your safety belt when you're on the water. New River has bike trails for all experience levels. For mountain bikers, check out the Arrowhead trails near Fayetteville where we have 13 miles of single track fast trails to interconnect. Other trails in the park follow abandoned railroad beds and run alongside the river. Some trails provide access to the water and views of historic sites. And before you go, check out our trails pamphlet to see where you can and can't bike. You can find it online. While you bike, please don't forget this. Like rock? We've got rock. 1,400 rock climbing routes line the walls along the lower gorge. Most routes are rated 5.9 and above for the more advanced climber. You can reach many routes from hiking trails. Some, however, are in remoter locations, making rescues difficult. Additional information is a must. Check out our park website for climbing information and visit our park visitor centers for free brochures and sale items. Whatever sport you choose, plan ahead. Know your skill levels. Be smart and be safe. And remember, we share these public land with others, so please be considerate and leave the parks just as you found them, if not better. And that is uh, Grandview Overlook, which is exactly where we are right now. We flip over to full screen here. Try and get a slightly better view. Ah, see you like that. All right, also I like their, <laughs> is it like rocks? We got rocks. Pretty funny way to pitch a, a rock wall. All right, Flying Singer, I see you off there in the distance. So that's a little bit about Whitewater, Whitewater Adventures. Hopefully you noticed some of the, uh, I, I saw a hydraulic jump in there. I saw all that kind of turbulent stuff too. Uh, it's pretty, Pretty fun, we know a little bit more about it, I think. Yeah, it is pretty. The whole area is really pretty. Actually, something that's unfortunate about the the flight sim is it doesn't capture the rock walls very well, but the rest of the park, I think, is, is really pretty gorgeous. Let me slow this plane down just slightly. <laughs> Fractals, I am gonna land on the water at the end of this video. Yes, or I, I will attempt to land on the water at the end of this video. I did a couple of practices, it was okay. Oh, why do you ask? I'm curious. Alright, so we'll stay a little bit up higher here for this next bit, because it's kind of fun to see as we come into the, the deeper gorge part, that sort of, you know, uh, carved into the landscape view. You can see a little bit of it behind us here. I was talking with a, a buddy of mine who flies uh, model planes, and he was telling me that the hardest part about remote controlled planes is when you fly them, you have to kind of imagine that you're the pilot in the plane, um, which is exactly what I have to do right now. It's like to turn left, I have to turn right, and all that kind of stuff. So, anyway, random sidebar. Okay. Yes, in <laughs> fact, just curious, yeah. I actually got a, a pretty a pretty fun photo on the water surface uh, fractals. If you go and look at that flight plan, um, there's a there's a there's a pretty one with the snow in the background and stuff. Actually, let's do that real quick while we're we're flying in. And while I get that set up, fractals, do you mind posting up the next hole here? So we'll do a small winter excursion while we while we do that. So our next topic today is coal mining. So the pole. 
<laughs> nice numbers. Uh, there we go. Why bring a canary into the coal mine? So is it if dangerous gases such as carbon monoxide appear in the mine, they'll kill the canary before the miners? Uh, sad, but but uh, reasonable answer. Or is it pleasant music? Record players are hard to come by. Or they detect coal seams. They got some sort of like smell that they can pick up on it. Give folks a second here to, to respond. So the connection to the park, the river, the New New River Gorge, or New New River, excuse me, has exposed four seams of coal considered among the best bituminous coal in the world. We'll talk about bituminous coal in a minute. The smokeless New River coal once fed the boilers of the nation's trains, factories, fleets, power plants, and its coke fueled the nation's iron furnaces. Uh, also, briefly, while people are voting on that canary in the coal mine, I had never seen... I knew that canary in a coal mine was a real thing, but I had never seen what it meant to bring a canary into the coal mine. So if, you, if you've ever wondered, um, I always thought that they were bringing these in and just um, kind of a, a spoiler, but it looks like most people have voted. Um, so I thought that they were bringing these in and, and just letting the poor canaries um, pass away there on the spot. Well, it turns out that the canary would sit in this little cage, and then if it detected carbon monoxide, they close that cover, and then the bottle on top is actually oxygen to, to revive it. Um, so they weren't just killing canaries all the time, which I very much appreciated. So it looks like most people got that one. The uh, why bring a canary in the coal mine? It was for the dangerous gases. So it was a way of checking um, that the miners are going to be safe uh, if they were staying down there for a long period. So let me pull up a quick video. This is from the National Park, and it talks about the Nuttleberg uh, mine site, which you can see off in the distance is our next destination here. I'm going to slow down a little bit. And while that video is playing, I'll see if I can get us in a position for a water landing here. Welcome to New River Gorge National River's newest secret, Nuttleburg. A hundred years ago, towns like Nuttleburg, Fayette, Fayer, Elmo, Barrie were all bustling coal mining towns found every half a mile up and down the New River. With over 50 coal mining towns throughout the New River Gorge, this area was rich in population and production. Nuttleburg was no exception. Once this railroad cut its way through the New River Gorge, towns began shipping smokeless coal out to industrial cities throughout the nation. In the 1920s, Henry Ford leased the Nuttleburg mine to provide coal for his automobile business. His idea of vertical integration was to control all aspects of the automobile production process. But his goal failed here in the New River Gorge when he realized he couldn't control the prices that the railroad was charging him to ship coal out to his businesses in the Northeast. Today, only the history remains of most of those coal mining towns found along the New River. The same was true for Nuttleburg. What little was left of the town was concealed beneath trees and vines. But in the last few years, the town of Nuttleburg has undergone an extensive transformation. The foundations for the original buildings were excavated, like you see here around me. New trails were built to enable you to explore the site. Interpretive waysides were erected so you could learn about the history as you explore the town. And of course, the tipple, the headhouse, and the conveyor were all stabilized to be preserved for future generations. Today, when you come visit Nuttleburg, you can get an authentic feel for what life was like in a coal mining town here 100 years ago. This effort has created one of the most intact examples of a coal mining community in West Virginia and the United States. But if I tell you any more, you won't have anything to find for yourself. So come explore and enjoy Nuttleburg Town Site in New River Gorge National River. Thanks, Venture Billy. A little bit of history on Nuttleburg, and just in time for me to attempt a water landing here. Now, uh, you need a certain amount of uh, space and a certain amount of training to do this sort of thing, and I don't really have either, uh, but what I do have is the ability to make it a bright sunny day, so we'll see how this goes. I'm also realizing uh, this is <laughs> the rapids we talked about, the, the very difficult part of the river to navigate, so we'll see. All right. My flaps down, start slowing the plane down a little bit. 
and I was talking with someone uh, it was actually someone at while I was getting my flight test it was the person in the uh, the room next to where I was testing um, just kind of in the airport hanging out and we were talking about uh, uh, amphibious planes and and uh, aquatic planes and stuff hey look at that not so bad uh, and apparently the plane itself is not very expensive it's the insurance on the plane that uh, that does it so we'll see I've always liked aquatic planes but uh, that may not be a may not be a reasonable one in the long term all right here we are in beautiful New River Gorge Gonna pop out. We can look around a bit. So we're gonna do a little a little boat tour, uh, right past the Nettleberg mine site. Let me pull up some quick pictures of the stuff that you're seeing here. So we have uh, thanks, silly guy. On the landing, <laughs> and I just gotta steer the boat. Okay, there we go. So this is kind of what the the general area looks like sense of that. We passed that Grandview Overlook. That's what that looks like. And then the Nettleberg Mine Site was in that video, but this is that, that tipple. And the Coal Mine Conveyor. There were once 60 different coal mine towns located in this area, so it's a pretty big deal around there. Uh, the tipple won't show up in the flight sim. It's a uh, it actually shows up on the, the ground a little bit, so it's like a projectant on the floor, but um, you can kind of see rocks in the water here, by the way. So if you were curious how big these rocks are. All right, so coal mining. What is coal first to start with? So coal is a combustible black or brownish sediment, sedimentary rock formed as rock strata, formed in rock strata, excuse me, uh, as rock strata called coal seams. So this is a picture of uh, coal bituminous, and then here's a picture of a coal seam. Kind of see it actually, it's a pretty, pretty prominent one. Coal is mostly carbon with the variable amounts of other elements. Uh, you may remember, oops, did I just go aground? That's so funny. <laughs> All right, it'll fix that one up real quick. Okay, great. This is why you don't uh, pilot a plane in pull up Colfax. So you may remember when we visited Gates of the Arctic National Park, we talked about petroleum, and petroleum is also mostly carbon. So in both cases, it's that, that good energy source. That's why people like it. I'll do this. Maybe I'll be able to see the water a little bit better here. You can imagine going kayaking down here. It'd be a pretty good trip. So coal is formed Like cooking along here, okay. Tell you what, my white water rafting is. Ah, oh, hey there, flying singer. I don't see your floats. That's too bad. Let's see if you have better luck uh, navigating this one. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so uh, coal is formed when dead plant matter decay into peat and is converted into coal by heat and pressure. Uh, of deep burial over millions of years. Coal is important because, uh, well, the history of coal goes back many thousands of years, with early mines documented in ancient China, the Roman Empire, and other historical economies. It became much more important, though, and oops, let me flip to this full screen, sorry. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Freckles. It became more important in the Industrial Revolution between the 19th and 20th centuries when it was primarily used to power steam engines, heat buildings, and generate electricity. It's also useful to know that, it, that the United States has the largest, world, the largest world share of coal, so there's more coal available in the U.S. than anywhere else in the world. Coal mining continues as an important economic activity today, but has begun to decline due to the strong contribution coal plays in global warming and environmental issues. Compared to wood fuels, coal yields a higher amount of energy per mass and can often be obtained in areas where wood is not readily available. The reason you might want to use coal for something. So our Nuttleberg uh, mine site is just off to our right here. If I don't get stuck in the sand again, it's uh, kind of there. You can see it sort of on the map here. 
as we pass double Z rapids. So I mentioned there's uh, bituminous coal. There's, there's a couple of other grades of coal as well. So the first one that we'll get talked about is peat. So peat is kind of a precursor to coal. Lignite then is, or brown coal, is the lowest rank of coal, and it's the most harmful to health. To health excuse me. Sub-bituminous coal, uh, whose properties range between those of lignite and those of bituminous coal, are used primarily for fuel of steam electric power generation. And I don't have a picture of sub-bituminous coal. It's kind of a gradient, so it's kind of hard to tell. And then bituminous coal, same picture that we saw before. So this is the dense sedimentary rock, usually black, often with well-defined bands of bright and dull material. It's used primarily as fuel in steam electric generation and to make coke. Now this isn't Coca-Cola or any other types you might know of. This coke is a gray, hard, and porous fuel with a high uh, carbon content and few impurities. It's made by heating coal or oil in the absence of air, and that becomes then a destructive distillation process. So it's how you can um, take coal and turn it into a more refined sort of fuel to use. It's an important, I'll flip back over here, excuse me. It's an important, uh, there you go, a little bit of that view. Uh, coke is an important industrial product used mainly in iron ore smelting, but also as a fuel in stoves and forges when air pollution is a concern. Because of the quality of bituminous coal in the New River area, the area we're flying in, much of these mining towns would convert their coal into coke. For instance, the red ash coke ovens in New River Gorge. So we passed a little ways back, we passed the New River coke ovens, uh, and that's what they were doing there. An example of what this looks like is uh, best seen as kind of an, uh, a row of beehive coke ovens that you would see in various towns, but there's a, a well-preserved one in Colorado. So this is what that looks like. These are, these are um, beehive coke ovens. This also then becomes a staple of what you might see in a kind of mining town like this if you were to go visit back in the day. And the reason for that is these ovens all glow red hot at night. So there's a postcard from Pennsylvania that you can see. So there's the tipple in the background, that same thing we saw for Nullberg, and then there's a row of these bee, uh, beehive ovens. There's a famous quote from a University of Wisconsin president, Charles uh, Van Heys, and he saw long rows of beehive ovens from which flame is bursting and dense clouds of smoke issuing, making the sky dark. By night, the scene is rendered indescribably vivid with these numerous burning pits. The beehive oven make the entire region of coke manufacturing one of dulled sky, cheerless and unhealthful. This sort of nods to one of the uh, other issues with coal, which is the health impacts. I won't go into a ton of detail here, uh, but there's a lot of history around it and, the, and around it and in this park uh, due to the coal mines. Something to look into if you're curious. That, uh, that takes us all the way through bituminous coal, but there's actually a higher grade of coal still. So this is uh, anthracite, and it's, the, uh, it's a harder, glossy black coal used primarily for residential and commercial space heating. So this is anthracite. anthracite. Technically, the highest grade of coal is graphite, but it's difficult to ignite graphite, and so it's not really used for fuel. Uh, but it is used in pencils or powdered lubrication. So you're probably familiar with graphite. All right, so how does coal mining work? The, uh, suppose you're in a place where you have naturally occurring coal, like in the River Gorge, but you gotta get it out somehow. So coal mining is the process then of extracting that coal from the ground. Coal extraction methods vary depending on where the mine is, uh, and if it's an underground mine or a surface mine. Hey there, Flying Singer. That must be the lack of floats. That's kind of weird. I expected actually to see more of the plane, but. Like, I expect to see people and stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Cool, well, fancy meeting you here. So, like I said, uh, coal, coal extraction methods vary depending on if it's an above ground, uh, sorry, a uh, surface mine or an underground mine. Additionally, the coal seam thickness and geology uh, are factors in selection of the mining method used. So for a surface mine, the most economical method, and there's a lot of ways that you can mine these, so I'm going to talk about the most economical method uh, because those are the most commonly used. It's all an economic scheme in the end, right? So the most economical method for a surface mine coal extraction 
is an electrical shovel or a drag line. So this would be a surface mine might look something like this. And the drag line, so I had never heard of a lot of these tools in here, so I'll pull up some pictures so you know what these all look like. The drag line excavator, one way that you would extract it, looks like this. And it works like this. Cool. Makes sense that you'd be able to pull a lot of coal from hard to reach areas. The power shovel is another way you could do it, so that looks like this. Kind of the inner working mechanics. I love these sort of sorts of diagrams. So you may have picked up from, from how I do the, the choice here. And in practice it looks something like this. And you'll notice that the caption here me me uh, mentions this overburden. So overburden is just anything on top of the mineral of value. So in this case, it's coal, but it's whatever is on top of that particular mineral. Underground mines, then the most economical form of underground mining is called long wall mining, which a sheer, uh, where a shear blade runs along a section of the coal seam. So this is what a long wall mine looks like. So that's on the right side of that would be the coal mine. And then the shear itself, that like spinning disc that you see there, looks like this. It's a pretty, Pretty gnarly looking piece of machinery, in my opinion. So that's the long wall mining is a common way that you would do uh, underground mines uh, nowadays. Previously, and the way that it was done mostly in the United States, was something called room and pillar mines. So at New River Gorge, they talk a lot about room and pillar mines because that's kind of what everything was here. I could not find any good pictures of what a room and pillar mine is, but I think I can hand wave describe it uh, briefly and it'll sort of make sense. So the gist is that you have uh, a room and then the pillars that support the ceiling of the ground. So you don't want the ground to cave in on the miners when they're underground. So what you do is you have uh, barrier pillars on either side and then panel pillars in the middle and then you mine in between those. So you're mining out that, that, that space between the pillars and then the pillars themselves um, are kind of leftovers for safety. There's a map of what this looks like. So this is looking from the top down on it and they note this as a very bad example of it because it's like a super poorly designed mine. Um, but you can see these pillars kind of interspersed in here. So you have these sort of tunnels and then you get these pillars that are supporting the, the ceiling. So again, it should be much more well designed than this, but this is a 1909 mine, no, 1805, anyway, it's a very old mine. The other thing that most of these coal needs to be sorted and cleaned to be more valuable, and so that's done in a coal preparation plant. So uh, tipple is uh, part of that, so this would be the sorting process. They now combine most of those into one central building. Uh, and the inside, So, but this is the one that we just saw at Nuttleberg, and the inside of that looks like this. So you have different uh, sizes of coal that are going to be sorted into different rail cars, and the rail cars can just pass right underneath and then get loaded up right, right on directly. An efficient way to do that. All right, and with any luck, we should be coming up here soon on the New River Gorge. So, in summary, coal is a combustible black or brownish black sedimentary rock. It's mostly made of carbon. It became important in the Industrial Revolution, and it was primarily used to power steam engines, heat buildings, and generate electricity. There's a range of coal grades from lignite to uh, anthracite. And mining coal requires either surface mines or underground mines. Each use different techniques, uh, but just like petroleum, the name of the game is always what is most economical. I will say, learning more about the history and health impacts, there's not a lot about coal that I want to joke about. Um, it, it was actually kind of hard and it was a bit too too depressing to bring into the stream, so I'll, I'll nod to it, but um, but I won't, I won't joke about coal. Uh, however, I will joke about overburden, which is uh, part of coal that we've been talking about. Hey there, Flying Singer, nice. Um, so uh, overburden, I really like that word as a way of describing the kind of material because it's this, 
it's this funny way of sort of saying like it's a useless layer on top but like we're going to be polite about it you know over it's just overburden it's overburden so this week i'm challenging everyone to try and slip overburden into a conversation like it's not cleaning up clothes on the floor it's can you take care of this overburden or trying to find something in your junk drawer it's really an exercise in holding back the overburden while you dig you know? or if you're talking about oreos you can mention it's just getting rid of that wafer overburden a little callback for you <laughs> all right here we go so flying singer i'm gonna take off here again we're gonna fly right up through the new river gorge Okay, good. One step down, two steps down. So that's the New River Gorge Bridge. This is the one that you may have driven over if you've been to the park before. Very famous bridge in the park. There's also, um, I'll pull up some pictures in just a moment. I know we only have a couple minutes here left. Uh, Fractals, start posting up some of the links. Thank you very much, Fractals. Let me close out real quick with the person of the week. And this person is Carter G. Woodson. And Carter G. Woodson, this is what this guy looks like. So Carter spent six years hand digging and loading coal for the payment of pennies on the ton in order to save money to attend one of the few black high schools at the time, Douglas High School in Huntington, West Virginia. During his years of work in the mines, which included work at both Kenmore and Nettleburg Mines, that's why he's the person of the week, uh, to present... Uh, uh, Carter Woodson would uh, listen to the stories of everyday lice of the fellow black miners and was inspired to document and teach the struggles and contribution of the African-American people. To quote him, in this circle, the history of the race was discussed frequently and my interest in uh, penetrating the past of my people was deepened and intensified. So he attributes his experience in the coal mines uh, of this area to, to some of what started his career. So he lived from 1875 to 1950. He was an American uh, historian, author, journalist, and the founder of the Association for the Study of the African American Life and History. He was one of the first uh, scholars to study the history of the African uh, diaspora, including the African, uh, including African American history. He has been called the father of black history. And part of the reason for that is in February of 1926, he launched the celebration of Negro History Week which was the precursor of Black History Month. So he was the kind of or origination of that sort of idea. Born in Virginia, the son of former slaves, Wood, slaves Woodson uh, had put off schooling while he worked in the coal mines. He later graduated from Baritha College and became a teacher and school administrator. He gained graduate degrees at the University of uh, Chicago and in 1912 was the second African-American uh, to obtain a PhD degree from Harvard University. Most of Woodson's academic career was spent at Howard University, a historically black university in Washington, D.C., where he eventually served as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. It's a little bit about Carter, Carter Woodson, excuse me. Uh, his story and Wikipedia page is long and fascinating, so I would encourage you to, to look into it a little bit more if you're curious, um, but a little bit of an intro in the park. All right, so we are flying just on the other side of New River Gorge. Let me pull up some photos of this. And in the last minute here, Fractals, do you mind pulling up that poll? And we will vote on where we want to go next. So a couple one, Fayette Station Bridge is just on the other side of the uh, New River Gorge Bridge. So that's sort of a, a little train bridge there. Then there's the New River Gorge and Bridge. So this is the actual bridge itself, which we just flew under. And then finally, there's a view from Hawk's Nest. So this is the view that you'd see uh, right about from where we are now, actually. And looking back on the river, which is why I have us facing this way, is you can kind of make it out in the water a little bit. Uh, there's a dam, and then off in the distance is where that, where that lines up. All right, thank you, Fractal. So what park are we exploring together next time? Joshua Tree, Everglades, or Sequoia National Park? While well, folks vote on that, I'll do a quick sign off here. So today we talked about New River Gorge National Park, our newest national park. We talked a little bit about uh, whitewater and whitewater rafting and other activities. We talked about coal mining. Our person of the week was Carter Goodson, Woodson, excuse me, Carter Woodson. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was what we covered today. Fractals posted up the survey and uh, links to the Discord and Twitter. A great way to keep in touch. I always love hearing from all of you, so feel free to reach out. 
And we'll give folks a second. I see votes are still coming in. All right. Fractals are sitting on a tie. What do you think? I guess I get to be tiebreaker then, huh? I think, I think, okay, so we'll give, we're one minute over. So let's do uh, tiebreaker decision here, uh, Everglades National Park next week. That'll be a fun kind of trip down to Florida and uh, a nice break maybe from, from colder weather, depending on where you are. I thought wife was tiebreaker. Oh, that's so true. Oh, thank you, Fractals. Okay, yeah, we should have wife tiebreak. Wife? Everglades? Everglades? Okay. Yes. Cool. I hope I didn't bias that too much, but... All right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Awesome. I'm excited to explore Everglades National Park with you all next week. And with that, thank you for being my co-pilot today. And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. And I will see you all next week.